This is an introduction to right heart catheterization. During a right heart catheterization, you are passing a catheter from the right atrium into the right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and subsequently into the wedge position. Each chamber and segment has a typical and normal pressure range. There are all sorts of indications for right heart catheterization. A key one is to determine the cause of shock. It can also be used to evaluate hemodynamics in valvular heart disease, extent of shunting, pre-heart transplant evaluation, and let's not forget evaluation of pulmonary hypertension. Whether there is a true absolute contraindication to right heart catheterization is open to debate. Certainly if there is significant endocarditis, thrombus or mass in the right heart, caution must be exercised. There are a number of relative contraindications that you will see here. Some may argue that a significant pulmonary embolism may be a contraindication, although measurement of PA pressure invasively can often be a part of catheter-directed thrombolysis protocols. And lastly, if a patient already has a left bundle branch block, performing right heart catheterization may, on occasion, induce transient complete heart block. Complications of right heart catheterization are very rare. On occasion, you may trigger an arrhythmia, and very rarely, cardiac perforation may occur if there is overly zealous technique. Perforation and rupture of the pulmonary artery is rare, but if it occurs, it's a devastating complication. Here is a list of the rest. There are a number of possible access sites, such as the internal jugular, basilic vein, or the subclavian vein. You can also use the femoral vein. At our center, if you're going to leave a Swan-Gans catheter in place and send the patient up with it, the internal jugular vein is the typical mode of access. We perform all internal jugular access with ultrasound. After prepping and draping the area, the patient's head is tilted away. And by ultrasound, which will be shown to you separately, the internal jugular vein and the carotid arteries are clearly identified and access is facilitated. A right heart catheterization can be performed with this simple wedge catheter. It effectively has only two ports, the one below to inflate the balloon and the one above for drawing blood or injecting. The balloon that is inflated is near the very tip of the device and we typically inflate the balloon and allow the flow of blood to help move the device into the pulmonary artery position. When we have to leave in a catheter, we typically use the more complicated Swan-Gans device. If you look more closely, you will see that it has, where the three arrows are, three ports for drawing blood or for injecting. When this device is in place, the PA distal port communicates with the tip of the catheter. You can draw blood from the very tip, for instance, when you would like to obtain oxygen saturations from the pulmonary artery. The RV infusion port communicates with the right ventricle and the proximal injectate port typically is 
positioned within the right atrium when in place. If you look carefully towards the center and left of this diagram, you will see where the output of the RV infusion and the proximal injectates are. The blue arrow shows the balloon inflation port. The next blue arrow towards the right shows a connector. This can be plugged into a circuit that can help calculate cardiac output using thermodilution. As you'll soon find out, there are two broad ways to calculate cardiac output with a Swan-Gans catheter. One is using the FIC method, where oxygen saturations are obtained, and the other is through thermodilution. With the thermodilution method, saline, typically at room temperature, is injected at the proximal injectate site. Then the thermocouple shown by the green arrow will detect temperature changes and calculate cardiac output. Now the easiest way to float a swan is from above, from the internal jugular vein. It will likely follow the flow and insert quite easily with minimal manipulation. You may not even require fluoroscopy. But let's assume for a moment that you're performing right heart catheterization from below, from the common femoral vein. This typically requires more catheter manipulation and can be more challenging. The key with any right heart catheterization is to look at the pressure tracings so you know whether you're in the right atrium or in the right ventricle and so on. An important bit of advice is to ensure that your catheter is placed into the RV as you see here and that the balloon starts to nod upwards. This is what I call the sweet spot. you will have the best chance of getting your right heart catheter into the pulmonary artery by maintaining and working from the sweet spot that I described, where you will see the nodding action. If you were to advance your catheter further in, you're likely to get caught in the wall or in perhaps some valvular apparatus and you're less likely to be able to float upwards. Now once you are in the sweet spot area, the best thing to do is to clock your wedge catheter until it starts to look up and then you should quickly make use of the opportunity and push the catheter into the PA. If clocking does not work, then counterclock rotation can sometimes do the trick. Now, as you float a swan, you will have the tip connected to the transducer. So you can see the typical pressure waveforms seen at the tip. And as you can see on the very left, the swan tip is within the right atrium and you can see the corresponding pressures below. As you float the swan into the right ventricle, the pressure waveform changes with high systolic upstrokes but the diastolic values remain low because this is a ventricular waveform. As you float up into the pulmonary artery, now you have an arterial waveform so the diastolic values, as you can see, are higher, and now you have a dichrotic notch. Next, as you advance the tip into the pulmonary artery branches and cause a wedge tracing, you can see a much more flat waveform.
the right atrial and by extension the jugular waveforms are demonstrated here. Please pause this video for a moment just to refresh yourself, but bear in mind that during right heart catheterization it is essentially impossible to identify every waveform. Typically the mean right atrial pressure is measured. Should the patient have significant tricuspid regurgitation then you will have large prominent CV waves and you can document their value separately. You will also be familiar of course with the X and Y descents that refer to atrial relaxation and emptying. For emphasis here are some additional slides to show typical right heart pressures. These are from a different source, so the numbers are slightly different. But in general, RA pressures, R5 or below, RV around 25 over 5, PA around 25 over 10, and normal pulmonary artery wedge pressures are around 8 to 12. As a general rule, it is advisable in non-ventilated patients to measure and document these pressures at the end of unforced exhalation. Now while an RA pressure speaks to right-sided filling pressures, a wedge pressure speaks to left-sided filling pressures. In fact, a PA wedge pressure corresponds closely to the LV and diastolic pressure. In the cath lab, we use the FIC principle to work out cardiac output more than any other. The FIC principle states that blood flow to an organ can be calculated using a marker substance if the following bits of information are known. The amount of marker substance taken up by the organ per unit time, the concentration of the marker substance in the arterial blood supplying the organ, and the concentration of the marker substance in the venous blood leaving the organ. Put another way, cardiac output can be estimated by oxygen consumption rate divided by the difference in arteriovenous oxygen content. Our marker substance is obviously oxygen. Here is the equation I would like you to use to calculate cardiac output using the FIC method in the cath lab. Because measuring actual oxygen consumption can be onerous, this is an estimate where 125 mils is multiplied by body surface area to give you the oxygen consumption estimate. So if an individual had a BSA of 2, their VO2 would be 250. Now, when you perform right heart catheterization, you can obtain oxygen saturations from the pulmonary artery position, and that would correspond to the SVO2 that you see in the denominator. Arterial oxygen saturations, such as those obtained from the aortic position, will give you the SAO2. As you can see, you also need the value of hemoglobin. And the 1.36 is a correction that applies to oxygen content pertaining to blood or hemoglobin. So let's imagine we have a patient with a body surface area of 2, an AO saturation of 98%, a PA saturation of 65%, and a hemoglobin of 11. Just so you familiarize yourself with this method, I would like you to pause and calculate cardiac output for yourself. But please remember that for the saturation values in this equation, you cannot enter 65%, but rather 0.65. And you cannot enter 98%, but rather 0.98. So please pause and work out the thick cardiac output here.
you should obtain the following numbers and as a result the cardiac output would be calculated at 5.1 liters per minute. Now imagine this scenario only the PA sat was lower, say 50%. Putting that into the formula would give you a larger denominator and as a result a lower cardiac output. Calculating cardiac index merely requires that you divide by body surface area. The top two rows show once again the equations that you have seen already. Once you have cardiac output, you can also work out systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance. To work out SVR, MAP or mean arterial pressure is used and from that you deduct right atrial pressure dividing that by cardiac output multiplying by 80 as shown. Pulmonary vascular resistance is worked at by taking mean PA pressure deducting pulmonary artery wedge pressure and dividing that by cardiac output and multiplying by 80. However, in the cath lab, the standard units of measure are a little different. We do not multiply by 80, and the number that we obtain is given in wood units. Though we strongly recommend that you work out these values yourself, there are apps available that can help you. Patients in the CCU who receive a Swan-Gans catheter typically get chest x-rays on a frequent basis. You can look at these images to ensure that the Swan appears to be where it should be and that there is no kinking and the tip has not extended too far beyond the midline. In addition to x-ray imaging, the waveforms picked up on the SWAN ports can give clues on its location. If you cannot get a PA waveform, it is possible that the SWAN tip has moved or perhaps dropped into the right ventricle. In those situations, a number of things can be tried, like deflating the balloon and reinflating it and trying to advance the device. Ultimately, if the waveforms are lost and cannot be regained, it might be necessary to position another swan. This slide is a wonderful summary explaining some of the concepts that we've talked about. As a final recap, my friends, I would like to remind you to get comfortable with the appearance and nature of the waveforms as you perform right heart catheterization. The right atrial pressures are typically low and relatively flat. When you reach the right ventricle, there are broad upswings, but the diastolic pressures are still relatively low. As you successfully reach into the pulmonary artery, the diastolic values start to rise and you may see a dichrotic notch. And finally, as you advance your balloon further and obtain a wedge tracing, once again, the waveform becomes flatter. Though there are exceptions, such as in cases where a giant V wave occurs. Some patients receive the tiny CardioMEMS device in their pulmonary arteries. This device can record pulmonary artery systolic and diastolic pressures and the PA diastolic pressure can correspond to wedge pressure for many patients. But despite the advancement of technology including imaging, right heart catheterization is still performed quite often 
and you will have the opportunity to participate in many of these procedures. Thank you very much for your attention.